morning everyone welcome to a new session of the open online course on latin american economic history today's lecturer is dr jesus fernandez villaverde professor of economics at the university of pennsylvania and director of the penn initiative for the study of markets he will talk to us about economics and political economy of the post-world war era in latin america professor jesus please thank you so let me share my screen And uh, let me get going. So today I basically um, wanted to talk uh, a little bit about revolutions and the Cold War. So at the end of World War II, very quickly, a Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union uh, quickly follows. And this Cold War has a very profound influence in Latin America. The Cold War is going to be superimposed over deep and ongoing processes of political and economic transformation within the region. We are having a process at the time of state consolidation that started with the oligarchic liberal republics that Ivan discussed last week, the very deep process of demographic change and the big demographic explosion of the 50s and the 60s, the process of industrialization induced by the import substitution strategy, the arrival of mass politics, etc. Some of these processes are independent from the Cold War. So, for instance, demographic change has very little to do with the Cold War. And yet, what the Cold War is going to do is to supercharge them. By that, I mean that a process that will generate a level of tension of, let's say, five, because it's happening during the Cold War, is going to generate a level of tension of 10. And a way to think about the Cold War is a competition between two modernization projects. On one hand, the project of liberal democracies with market economies championed by the United States. And on the other hand, is the modernization project of socialism led, led by the Soviet Union. And they are going to fight for hegemony in emerging economies. And that's why we are going to have this supercharge, charging of all the processes in Latin America. This supercharging is going to lead to a cycle of political polarization that will end up in a revolution and in authoritarian reaction. And that means that democratic reformism is going to become extremely difficult. There are going to be a few cases where democratic reformism is going to work, but by and large, most countries are not going to be able to handle democratic reform without falling either on the extreme of revolution or the other extreme of authoritarian reaction. And also, for one of the few times in world history Latin America is going to become the center of global events, even if briefly due to the Cold War. And the best way to think about this, of course, is, I don't know why this is not working. Give me one second. No, it should work. What we are going to have is indeed, this is a photograph from the missile crisis in Cuba in 1962. And you can see here the Soviet ship Poltava en route to Cuba. And of course, it's the Cuban missile crisis that is going to be at the core of um, everything that is going to happen uh, during this Cold War. Just as an aside, uh, Poltava is a town in Ukraine where um, Peter the Great defeated the Swedish army and led to the big of the creation of the modern Russian empire. And that's why Poltava in the Russian imaginary is such an important place. And given that we are having a war in Ukraine right now, I thought it was paradoxical to have precisely this ship at this moment. So what is the traditional historiographical view about the Cold War? Well, this traditional historiographical view puts as the center as a big factor the United States. It highlights that the United States have always had expansionary ambitions in all the Americas, first with the Monroe Doctrine that basically prevented or 
stated that other European powers could not intervene in the Americas. And later in the Mexican War between 1846 and 1848, where the United States annexed a very large part of Mexico. Later on, we are going to have events like the War of 1898 between Spain and the United States that is going to lead to the independence of Cuba and Puerto Rico becoming a commonwealth within the United States. The Platt Amendment, which was basically a condition on the Cuban constitution that made Cuba a subordinate state of the United States until it was repealed, and the gunboat diplomacy where the US will impose its will in a lot of Caribbean countries. Paradoxically enough, and despite this story of intervention, after 1945, the traditional historiographical view highlights that on the one hand, the US cares relatively little about the region. The US has a focus on Eurasia, both the Western Europe and East Asia, because the US considers that those are the main fronts in the Cold War. But on the other hand, even if the US is not very concerned about Latin America or cares relatively little about it, the US is worried about Soviet influence and is going to support authoritarian regimes like the one by Perez Jimenez in Venezuela over reformist democratic governments. And this tension between the US caring about preventing Soviet influence on one hand, but on the other, not paying a lot of attention to the region, is going to lead to multiple US interventions, like in Guatemala. Uh, in the extra lecture, in the video in the extra lecture, I'm going to talk quite a bit about Guatemala in 1954, the Dominican Republic, etc. Inconsistent changes in a strategy. So the US is going to create the Alianza para el Progreso, and you can see here. Kennedy with a lot of Latin American presidents when the Alianza para el Progreso is launched. On Thursday, in the guest lecture, um, the invited speaker will discuss more the Alianza para el Progreso and generally bad outcomes, such as the Escuela de las Americas in Panama, that was at the core of the training of many of the, milita of many of the military that later conducted the dirty wars during the 1970s and coups. And you know, one of the most famous examples of coups, since we are going to discuss other coups uh, along the, the video and in the next video, it was the one in Brazil in 1964. You can see over here the monuments in Brasilia. If you want to get a summary of this traditional view of the historiography, a book by Stephen Rapp, The Killing Zone, The United States Wages Cold War in Latin America, summarizes that investigation. And I guess you can get the point of the book because you can see over here Henry Kissinger shaking the hand of Pinochet in Chile, demonstrating the support of the US to the Pinochet regime. Hmm. There is much of truth in that traditional historiographical view. And I know it's a historiographical view also that is very popular in Latin America. It's perhaps the way in which most well-educated Latin Americans think about the Cold War. But over the last decade, decade and a half, there has been a big, deep change in how we think about the Cold War in <clears throat> Latin America. And I'm going to call this a new historiographical view. And if you want to learn more about it, I will strongly recommend two books, The Global Cold War by Ott Arne Westad, a fantastic book, and Latin America's Cold War by Hal Brands. <clears throat> this new historiographical view builds on two facts. First, that now we have access to many more documents that in previous decades, so we actually understand how things happen behind closed doors better than before. And also because from the distance of time, we can also understand the choices better. The first point that this new historiographical view highlights is that Latin American actors had agency. By agency, I mean that they had degrees of freedom. In particular, this historiography shows that local elites use the US as much as the US use the local elites. 
the local elites, imagine that you are a local elite in your average Latin American country and you are worried about some political developments, you are going to have an incentive to reach out to the US ambassador or to the US Department of State and misrepresent the situation in the country precisely to achieve your own particular goals. So yes, the US intervened in Latin America, but a lot of those interventions were the consequence of Latin American elites manipulating the US, not the other way around. The second point that this new historiography uh, highlights is that most of the coups in Latin America will have probably happened anyway without use intervention. Why? Because local elites have agency and capability. Coming back to the point of Pinochet, in some sense, it's a little bit demeaning to Chileans to argue that their military was completely manipulated by the CIA and that they didn't have the agency and capability to organize a coup by themselves. The Chilean army was always a very capable army. They were perfectly capable to organize a coup on their own. Of course, the CIA is supporting them. That makes things a little bit easier. But most likely, even without any intervention of the US, there will have been a coup in Chile in 1973. And the best example, of course, is in Brazil, where the 1964 coup had very little to do with the US intervention. The second point that the new literature highlights, the new historiography view highlights, is that both the United States and Latin American countries were multi-agent actors. Okay, So you are not, or you should not think about the US as just one monolithic set of power and Latin America and a Latin American country as another one. There were different actors within each country that had very different goals and strategies, which were often contradictory to each other. So for instance, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Latin America policy was very different from Kennedy's, despite both being democratic presidents. And in fact, there was no US intervention in Latin America between 1933 and 1954 a period of 21 years that I don't think has happened ever again without this type of intervention. We now always remember that the CIA tried to assassinate Castro and organize an invasion, and that's true. But what people also forget is that at the beginning of the, um, uh, the guerrilla campaign, the CIA actually gave $50,000 to Castro guerrillas, and that the New York Times coverage was key for Castro's victory. Fidel Castro movement was only one among different opposition movements in Cuba. And it was the fact that the New York Times covered Castro and interviewed him extensively that propelled Castro ahead of all his competitors within the opposition to Batista, the uh, president of Cuba at that time, and got the support of uh, the rest of the world. Something similar can be said about much of the uh, most of the other US media, for instance, the CBS, the big network, also cover Castro's guerrilla from a very, very positive uh, perspective. And later in the war on drugs, uh, which is going to play some role in what we are going to say about the 80s and the 90s, the goals of the, the um, Drug Enforcement's, uh, Enforcement Agency, the DIA, and the FBI or the CIA are going to be again contradictory. So you don't want to think about the US or Latin America countries as just one person or one actor. There are many, many actors with many, many goals and very different views about what to do. A second point or a third point that is very important to remember is that the US influence in the Caribbean and Central America was much stronger than in South America and to a very large extent, even that in Mexico. So the type of things that the US could do in Guatemala or in the Dominican Republic were very different than what the US could do in Brazil or Argentina. And that's why there are going to be very different responses to nationalizations. When Guatemala tries to undertake land reform, the way in which the US is going to react is very different than when Mexico undertakes a land reform. So you really have a whole range of situations. This leads us to a more general point which is that different Latin American countries reacted to the same challenges created by the Cold War in very heterogeneous ways. There is no such a thing as the typical Latin American response. 
And also the influence often went in the opposite direction. So for instance, this book by Thor Olson makes the case that the agrarian reform in Mexico after the revolution was very influential in the land reform and agricultural reform in the United States during the 1930s under the New Deal. So we do not want to think about the influence always coming from the US to Latin America. It also goes in the opposite direction. We have a growing understanding of the role of the Soviet Union intervention. So, you know, the US, of course, often exaggerated the degree of communist uh, subversion in Latin America, but that doesn't imply they were not communists in Latin America and that the Soviet Union was not providing them with financial and military aid. Similarly, we know that, and we have come to appreciate the enormous role of Cuba in Africa and the rest of Latin America. I recommend to read these books, Conflicting Missions, Havana, Washington, and Africa. Um, just as an anecdote, Piero Gleyeses, the, um, the author of the book, is a professor of history. Um, he's married to the sister of Yoko Ono. So I guess his, the brother-in-law was the brother-in-law of um, um, the Beatle guy. And um, in particular, the presence of Cuban forces in Angola and Mozambique is going to play a big role in contemporary African history. And finally, that Cuba is going to be able to manipulate the Soviet Union. So uh, Che Guevara had a theory about revolutionary war that focused on something he called the focus, the centers or focus of revolutionary in, um, intervention. And the Soviet Union was very reluctant to support this focus. And yet Cuba is able to manipulate the Soviet Union into supporting this focus in 1967-68 by accusing the Soviet Union of not being revolutionary enough. Another important point is that the Cold War is a strange, like I guess many other wars, because it's full of non-transitivities. By non-transitivity, I mean a strange friendships. So Franco in Spain, and Castro in Cuba kept a very warm relationship. They both really like each other, which you could say, how can it be? Well, maybe it's because Franco was from Galicia and Castro was the son of a, a Galician father. So maybe it was just that, but both of them kind of like and admire each other in part because both of them really dislike the United States. And finally, the last point I want to highlight is that there were many, many other agents playing roles in Latin America during the Cold War, and somehow we never think about them. One that I find quite interesting is France's influence in Argentina's military, since it was just a few days ago that uh, it was the anniversary of the coup in Argentina. Well, when you actually interview the Argentinian officers that participated in the dirty war, what they will tell you is that what really influenced them in their behavior and in their um, campaign against the guerrillas was what French officers did in the war uh, in the war in Algeria between 1954 and 1962. And the link is not surprising because as you probably know, France has always had a big intellectual influence in Argentina and other countries in the Southern Cone because of the linguistic similarity. So now the main intellectual fathers of the repression in Argentina were not the American military, it was actually the French military. Um, we also know, for instance, how Trujillo organized terrorism across all the Americas. Trujillo was the dictator in the Dominican Republic for three decades, um, El Jefe was called, and um, how he actually had a very active role in organizing terrorism, uh, killing opponents all across Latin America. I mentioned before the case of Chile, and again, coming back to this point, this highlights Kissinger with Pinochet, but there were many more people playing roles in Chile. For instance, the Chilean military was help and advice on how to conduct the coup and the repression after what by Brazil. 
Brazil also had a military government at the time, and Brazil is also a very high capability army within the Latin American context. But we also know, on the other hand, that a lot of the advisors in the uh, Salvador Allende uh, Unidad Popular government came from Cuba or had been trained in Cuba. And then we have Paraguay that for much of this time was really a subordinate state to Brazil and that it was really Brazil that decided to keep Stroessner in power and uh, or eliminate him later on. We also have the German multinationals that play a big role in Argentina and Brazil. So over here is a photograph of Volkswagen to Brazil. Why do I mention that? Because, you know, when we think about multinationals in Latin America and their effect, we always think about things like the United Fruit Company, but we forget the role of Volkswagen. And in fact, um, the guerrillas at the time understood this very well because Volkswagen in, in Brazil was often one of the targets of terrorist attacks. And the last actor that played a role was China, uh, indirectly by creating a template of revolutionary war based on the countryside uh, through uh, imitation of what Mao did in his own conquest of power in China, but also directly through uh, the influence of Maoist movements, perhaps the most famous of which is Sendero Luminoso in Peru. And you see here one of the posters that Sendero uh, printed and distributed across Peru. And you can see over here, El Poder Nace del Fusil, power comes from and the barrel of a gun, which is a famous saying about Mao Zedong. Okay, so you can very, very clearly see how China also play a role in Cold War in the Americas. So what I have tried to do now so far is try to tell you, look, the Cold War was really very important. Why the Cold War was so important? Try to tell you a little bit about the traditional view, which as again, and I emphasize, has a lot of very good things and kernels of truth on it, but also to tell you to be much more nuanced. And, you know, it's still the case that when I read popular descriptions of what happened in Latin America during the Cold War, most of these popular descriptions are I will say extremely simplistic and miss the enormous complexity of what was happening at the time. I mentioned to motivate this class, this lecture, that Latin America was undergoing huge structural changes. So since this is a class on economic history, let me focus on the most relevant of these structural changes from an economic perspective. As we saw in previous lectures, the 1914-1945 cycle of world wars and depressions unhinges the Latin American model of export-led growth. And really, it leaves a situation where what is going to happen in the future? Can we come back? You know, imagine that you are Latin American president in 1945. Is Export-led growth going to be a feasible a way to a feasible way to operate, or we are going to have just yes, a World War III that will make export-led growth again impossible. While Latin American economies or Latin American countries did not see any direct combat operation during World War II beyond a few naval engagements close to the coast, but you know, no America city uh, gets bombed. There is no battles in the Americas. The war economy disrupted traditional economic and social structures. If you want to learn more about it, there is a bunch of very nice book. Humphreys has two volumes, Latin America and the Second World War, volume one and volume two. Uh, focusing a little bit more on the military and social aspects, Latin America during World War II, edited by Leonard and Bratzel, does a very nice job. And if you just want to, you know, something a little bit more of a light read, uh, but about how the US and Britain um, participated in the political developments in Latin America during World War II, the Tango War by Mary Jo McConaughey is actually a very nice read. And if you are in the United States, last time I checked, it was only 99 cents on Kindle. So it's really a very good bargain. So what is going to happen? Well, first of all, the war is going to create an 
incredible demand for commodities. The US and to a smaller degree, the United Kingdom where effort requires tons of commodities. And this is a great time to be a commodity exporter. Also, there is going to be the need to introduce planning. So some type of central planning to allow the economy to adapt to the requirements of the world. And there is going to be a substitution of imports, not because there is any type of plan policy, but just because it's impossible to import. Let me give you a very simple example. Uh, Latin America, one of the big imports of Latin America right before World War II are cars, automobiles made in the United States. But the United States automobile industry fully moves into war production, producing tanks and airplanes during World War II. So it cannot produce any car to export to Latin America. That means that for the first and probably only time, we are going to have a short run absence of conflict between exports and import substitution, industrialization interest. Okay, we will see, and I think Ivan already discussed that, but we will come back to that later on, that the 1950s and 1960s are going to be in part a conflict between should we export more or should we have more of an import substitution strategy? Well, during World War II, that's not really a constraint. Both things can be accomplished at the same time. And also, the end of World War leaves many open questions regarding the future of the International Economic Organization. Is the IMF and the World Bank really work as they were supposed to work or are going to be different? And this is really interesting because this is going to be despite Latin America's role in Bretton Woods. And this is a nice book by Herek, Eric Helen, Heleiner, uh, Forgotten Foundations of Bretton Woods, where the author highlights that in Bretton Woods, around half of the delegations were Latin America delegations. You don't remember much of the wall at the time was either conquered by Germany or Japan, or it was a still a, colon a colony of the United Kingdom or France, so they didn't have their own independent delegations. So a lot of the people that participate in Bretton Woods are actually Latin American uh, civil servants and economists, and that they are going to have a lot of input and positive feedback into the design of the IMF. And I find this is funny because, you know, in Latin America, often people think about the IMF as this thing created by the United States and imposed on them, when in fact, Latin Americans play quite a bit of a role on the creation of the IMF. Also, the US at the end of the war is going to focus on development on rebuilding Western Europe and East Asia. And William Clayton, that was the Undersecretary of the Commerce at the time, makes it very clear in a conference with Latin American countries in Chapultepec in 1945, where it pretty much tells Latin Americans, look, don't expect any economic aid from the US. You need to figure it out on your own. So let's look at some of these figures and how we have this process of transformation. Over here, what I'm going to show you is some of the growth rates of GDP, GDP per capita, exports, et cetera, of Latin American countries and weighted by population and weighted by population. And I'm going to compare it with other countries. The first thing I want to highlight, let's focus for instance over here on GDP per capita, is that these are going to be the years of the highest growth in per capita income ever in Latin America. Between 1950 to 1973, per capita income is going to grow at 2.6%, much higher than afterwards and much higher than before. Okay. If you account total growth, because population was growing very fast, the performance is even more impressive. It's around 5.2 or 5.3 if you weight or don't weight. How this compares with other areas? Well, it actually does better than Africa. It does better than the rest of Asia. It only falls behind China and East Asia. So basically over here, think about South Korea and Taiwan, but if you also had Japan, it will be around there. So what you are having over here is that Latin America is actually going to do surprisingly well in terms of income per capita growth, but is not going to do very well in comparison with East Asia. 
you are going to see, for instance, that productivity, the big difference is going to be on productivity growth. So while in East Asia, the productivity of labor is growing at a 4.3%, in Latin America, it's only 34 more worrisome, the productivity of capital is growing at a 2.2% in East Asia, is falling minus 0.6% in Latin America. What are you having over there? Well, that import substitution and other distortions led to very inefficient use of capital. Nonetheless, this process of economic growth led to a substantial change in employment structure. Latin America went in 1950 from being a region that had a heavy agricultural base of 50% of employment to be only 29% in 1980, while services grew from 26 to 45%. So fast economic growth and fast change in the economic structure. Of course, Latin America, we keep emphasizing, is this extremely heterogeneous region where, for instance, the GDP in 1950 of Argentina is very different from the GDP of El Salvador. And what you are going to see also is that we are going to have very different experiences in terms of industry per capita growth in industry as percentage of GDP and the annual growth in real GDP per capita. Let me jump this graph, maybe this table is maybe a little bit more useful. Let's think for instance about these comparisons. Argentina is going to grow between 1950 and 1981, 2.9% a year. This is total growth. So you need to subtract population to get a product, a to get per capita growth is going to be much lower than Brazil. Brazil is going to go at 6.8, big difference over there. You are going to have Chile, you are going to have Colombia, Mexico, and then you are going to have other countries doing a little bit worse like Venezuela. So Argentina is already over here, a country that is clearly not doing very well. And if you move to the 81.90, it's even clearer why Brazil is still able to get 2.3, Argentina is getting only minus 0.6%. Now, something I find quite fascinating is that there is not that much difference in growth between countries that are oil exporters and countries that are oil importers. Yes, oil exporters between 1950 to 1981 grow at a 5.8% while oil importers only grow at a 5%, but later on things are reversed between 1981 and 1990, when the price of oil goes down, oil exporters only grow at a 0.4%, while oil importers grow at a 2.1%. And that's why in the wider time between 1950 to 1990, what you get is that the difference between oil exporters and oil importers is only 0.3%. So having oil is good, at least in the short and in the middle run. But it doesn't seem like having oil is really a game changer for a lot of Latin American economies in terms of allowing for much faster growth. What is really amazing, this is one of the most amazing graphs I have ever seen, is the big drop on exports as a percentage of GDP. You can see how exports as a percentage of GDP go down from around 19% to 9%. While the rest of the countries in East Asia are having this very export-oriented growth, Latin America is having an extremely inward-oriented growth. And you can see that this is happening even when manufacturers as a percentage of GDP is growing. Now, another thing that is very interesting, in this graph, we also have the exports of primary commodities over GDP. So what you have in the middle between these two lines are the exports that are not primary commodities. And the really amazing thing is that there was always a little bit of non-primary commodities exports. And if you fast forward, another 20 years, or in this case, 25 years, these 
and these are roughly the same. And that to me is one of the biggest or I think most compelling arguments of how import substitution was a failure. You are able to increase manufacturers as part of GDP, but you are never able to generate exports from your manufacturers. And since you are never going to be able to generate export to your for your manufacturers, you are not going to be able to have the sufficient scale and the sufficient efficiency that is going to allow you to have a clear and fast development. And if we go back a few slides back, this is exactly what I was telling you about productivity. So import substitution is a strategy that accomplishes some of its immediate goals the Latin American economies become much more, clo much close, much more close to trade with the rest of the world. Remember that imports are roughly the same that exports. So, you know, this is also a graph for imports and that manufacture much more than before, but they cannot deliver the type of development and growth that we are going to see in Korea, in Japan, in Taiwan, et cetera. Well, I highlighted at the very beginning the importance of the demographic revolution. And in particular, what Latin America is going to experience during this part of uh, its, it, its history is extremely fast population growth. In particular, what we are going to have is that birth rates are going to fall later than death rates, and that's going to lead to a gigantic increase in population growth. There is not going to be a lot of immigration in Latin America after World War II. There is still a little bit. You know, for instance, there was non-trivial amount of Spanish immigration into Venezuela until the, the 1970s, but the big immigration flows, immigration flows from the past are gone. So let me show you, for instance, what we are going to have. In 1930, the world was around 2 billion people. By 1990, it was 5.2. So population multiplied by 2.64. And what we see is that Latin America population multiplied by four. So it went from 110 million to 448. Latin America was a little bit below North America. And then by the end, actually had nearly twice as much population as uh, North America. The only other part of the world that grew so fast was Africa, where population grew by 4.14%. This is, of course, what is going to, as mentioned before, hide a lot of heterogeneity. And while you have growth rates of two, two and a half percent all across the Latin and Latin America, you are going to have countries like Argentina that they are going to be below two percent, but you are also going to have countries like let me uh, highlight some of the highest uh, growth rates, like the Dominican Republic growing at a three percent, Ecuador, El Salvador, or Nicaragua growing Honduras or Mexico growing really, really fast, okay? And on the other hand, you have over here Uruguay that you can already see their population, you know, by the, between 1970 and, 19, and 1990 already go. And remember, Uruguay is already losing population except for immigrants. There are more Ur Uruguayans dying than being born. Okay? So you can already see some of the initial uh, steps of this demographic transformation over there. Uh, I mentioned before that the death rates are going to fall before the birth rates. This is what this table is trying to illustrate. Uh, let me show you, for instance, Ecuador. Um, you know, we haven't discussed much Ecuador in this course. So Ecuador, you have a birth rate of 48 and a death rate of 25. By the end of our sample, for instance, over here, uh, the death rates are 45, per, uh, birth rates are 45.6, so very, very small reduction. But at the same time, death rates have already gone down from 25 to 14. And later on, the birth rates are 35 per thousand, death rates are 8 per thousand. So you have that in general, as in most other countries, the death rate falls first, and then the birth rate follows a little bit later, depending on how long this takes. This gives you this big demographic revolution, this multiplication of the population by a factor of four. And you know you can see the same in terms of birth per woman, how it went from 5.86, actually as late as 1960-65, and only to 
1980 to 1985. Right now, just to give you a feeling on how much these things have changed, the fertility rate in Latin America is around 1.8, you know, which is well below 2.1, which is replacement. Okay, so that's what I was mentioning the first day. Look, we have gone from 6.0 to 1.8, really, in two generations. So I imagine that 1960 to 1965 is when many of your grandmothers have kids. So you went, your grandmother generation had six kids on average. Your mother's generation probably have around three and a half kids on average. Your current generation is having 1.8 kids on average. So it's huge. Um, huge revolution, and I'm pretty sure, of course, many of you have different families, but I'm pretty sure that either in your family or some of your friends, you see this. You see that in the generation of your grandmothers, the number of kids was very, very different that in the current generation. And that gives a population that is very skewed towards uh, younger people. For instance, the percentage of population under age 15 in countries like and let me see some of the highest ones, like over here, El Salvador is 46%, Nicaragua is 46.8%. This is a gigantic number. That means that basically half of the population are children. And a way to think about it is that in countries like Spain right now, that percentage is around 10%, okay? That just gives you a feeling of how, how different these things are. And that gives you a dependence ratio that is actually also quite high because you have a lot of younger people and not that many adults to uh, take care of them. Um, life expectancy also goes up. You know, it goes from around 52 years to 66.7. Infant mortality goes down from very high numbers, 126 to 61. And again, we see heterogeneity by 1980, 1985, Costa Rica or Cuba, or even Chile, uh, Uruguay over here, they look a lot like an advanced economy, okay? So at that time, the life expectancy in France or in Germany or in Spain was maybe around 77, 76. So if you are Costa Rica, you are only a couple of years behind. That's pretty good. But in 1950, you were actually quite behind. This is just another way to say that the death rates fell first in Latin America ahead of the fall of uh, fertility. And again, infant mortality also goes to numbers that are quite comparable in some cases like Costa Rica or Uruguay or Cuba, quite comparable to other advanced economies while you still have things like Colombia, uh, sorry, Bolivia over here falling a little bit behind. Uh, what other transformations we have? We have also the fast urbanization. Not only we have this big boom in, in population, but it, there is also a lot of move from the countryside to the cities. And that's what we are going to have, the large metropolia that characterize modern <coughs> Latin America, mainly Mexico City, Buenos Aires, Sao Paulo, et cetera. We are also going to have, you can see over here, the urban population, how it goes from being 17% to being 65. Again, this is a huge change, okay, 17. So. You know, in 1970, 1930, sorry, Latin America is a rural economy, it's a rural society. In 1980, it's a very urban society. And I don't know, let me think about some of the most amazing changes, Dominican Republic from seven to 51%. Okay, so you really, really have, or Venezuela, you know, went from 14% to 83%, okay? This is a tremendous, think about it, it's just in, in 50 years, you have this tremendous change. So. Think about, again, um, your average Latin American in 1930 has six kids, lives in a rural area, works in agriculture. By 1980, it has three kids, lives in a city, and works in the service sector. So it's really an incredible transformation. And that's the transformation really behind a lot of the tensions associated with the, with the, with the Cold War. Um, in the interest of time, let me skip some of the changes in agriculture and industry, but you know that summarizes some of the other numbers we already saw before. And also the fact that you start having a change in gender roles with many more women joining the labor force um, as, as before, but it's still the case that you know in Latin America, as late as 1980, 
women have joined the, the labor force in the market much less than in other countries. It's also a time of big changes in, um, um, uh, sorry, there is someone, I can hear someone typing. Um, there is um, also a big change in um, a number of years of study. And uh, for instance, you have that in Brazil, in 1960, 41% of the population has no education whatsoever. 30% has one to three years. Uh, so basically you have 70% of the population with next to no education whatsoever. By 1980, you have only 50% of the population. And 13 years of more, which is um, college, some college education. Let me pick, for instance, Peru. Uh, sorry, Mexico. Mexico we went from one6 which means very few people went to university at all. This, is, this does not mean you actually graduated from university. It meant that you went at least one year to university from 1.6% to 6.2%. still very low in comparison with other countries, but a very different board game. Okay. So what I have done so far is I have tried to tell you that you have this enormous process of demographic and social change and economic transformation. And that's going to have a direct impact on politics. Look, this is a class on economic history. This is not a class on political history, but unless we understand the political history of Latin America during these decades, we are not going to be able to understand a lot of what is going to happen in terms of the economic policy. And in particular, what we need to focus is that around 1944, close to the end of World War II, we, uh, Latin America is going to experience a democratic spring with electoral victories of many different candidates from many different uh, positions, most of which were committed to some degree or another with making their political process within their country more democratic. Okay, It's not that I'm claiming that all these were great presidents or that I support their policies. I'm just claiming that these were products of uh, trying to change a uh, political system. So perhaps the one that was more open about their democratic interest was Ramon Grau San Martin in Cuba, but you also have many others in many other countries. And also, you also have that democratic forces oust quasi authoritarian or openly authoritarian regimes in Guatemala and in Ecuador in 1944, in Venezuela in 1945, in Bolivia in 1946, and you have the end of the Estado Novo in Brazil, which had been kind of a half corporatist, half fascist experiment in Brazil during the 1930s and early 1990s. Sadly enough, this process of democratization suffers from a fast reversion between 1948 and 1952 in Colombia, in Peru, in Guatemala, in Cuba, etc that pushes us back to a situation of, again, many more authoritarian regimes. And this whole process of a democratic spring, a fast conversion, and an evolution uh, is the consequence of the confluence of many different political movements. In Uruguay and Costa Rica, we are going to have more traditional movements that are going to look a little bit, not totally, I want to be very careful, but that look a little bit like your standard social democratic party in Western Europe. In Chile, during the time of the Popular Front and the radical governments that Ivan mentioned the other day, and in Ecuador, you are going to have alliances between socialists and communists on one hand with old style radical liberals, liberals that were more left-winning, left-leaning. But what is going to really become the main contribution, I don't know if I want to call this contribution, but certainly the main innovation that Latin America is going to give to the world is the modern populist movement. Okay, so um, some sense the big two things that Latin America has given the planet in the 20th century from a political economic perspective are the populist movements and the import substitution strategy. So what are these? Okay, if you want to read, by the way, I forgot about this demographic spring, this book by uh, Leslie Bethel and Ian Roxborough is very nice. 
Latin America between the Second World War and the Cold War. Okay, so what is populist politics? Okay, by populist politics, I'm going to refer to a relatively heterogeneous, but also mm, movements that have some commonalities that basically have both nationalist and revolutionary goals. The most famous example will be Lázaro Cárdenas in Mexico, Aya de la Torre in Peru, Velasco Ibarra, Elifer Gaitán, etc. Now, they are often called populist, and I'm always a little bit worried about calling someone populist, because populist usually means in 90%, especially in the media, I don't like this politician. So if I want to insult someone, I say, well, you're a populist. On the other hand, some of these politicians will call themselves populists, and they were very proud of calling themselves populist. I think populism is a useful term if used carefully, but not as a term of abuse. So I don't want you to go home saying, oh, Jesus says this a politician is populist. It means he's a bad politician. No, I just want to use populism as a descriptive term of a bunch of movements that flourish in Latin America during those years. Populist politics is going to be the mechanism through which political modernization happens in Latin America and the way in which oligarchic liberal regimes are going to evolve, are going to evolve into modern mass democracies. In that sense, populist movements have many similarities with European social democratic parties. European social democratic parties, think about the SPD in Germany, Labour in the United Kingdom, are going to be the vehicle that is going to incorporate the working classes and to some degree also a lot of farmers into the modern political system starting in the late 19th century, early 20th century. And the same role is going to be played by populist uh, movements and politicians in Latin America. On the other hand, they are going to be very different. And I'm going to highlight in just one slide why these movements are very different from your very plain vanilla social democratic party in Western Europe. In fact, a uh, very first point to keep in mind is that these populist parties and leaders are going to very be very hard to classify along the left right sorry left right continuum of western democracies okay so you go to your boring western european country you have a conservative or christian democratic party on the right a social democratic party on the left and some type of liberal centrist party in the middle nothing like that is going to really happen in latin america Perón in Argentina, as, as we will argue in a second, is the archetypical populist movement, is opposed both by the conservative parties and the old uh, oligarchic elites, but also by the socialist party. And there is going to be a left wing and a right wing Peronism. Peronism is this really fascinating political movement because it's really the only political movement I'm aware of where you can be very, very left wing and still be a Peronista and be very, very right wing and still be a Peronista. So, you know, Peronismo and populism in general are something a little bit different. So what are some of the main features that political scientists and economists have highlighted of populist movements? First, that most populist movements, if not all, have a strong charismatic leader at the center. The fact that we call Peronismo, Peronismo says it all. It's not thing else but the name of the original leader, Peron. And this leader is going to appeal to the people directly by passing the quote-unquote oligarchy, or if you use the Spanish word sometimes, la casta, by getting around formal institutions. There is going to be a deep mistrust of formal institutions. Elections are going to be more referenda on the charismatic leadership of the president than ways of regular political competition. 
populist movements are going to play, are going to blame under development on corruption, on oligarchy, on multinationals, on the US. And again, I, I'm not trying to claim this is wrong. I'm just trying to claim that this is their argument. Nationalists are great at one thing. They are the first movement in all Latin America that understand how to run a modern electoral campaign, how to use the media like newspaper, the radio, later TV, and forge a coalition of working and middle class voters. Populist movements are by and large extremely successful electorally. They have a very strong and large urban electoral base, while rural voters often vote for more traditional parties. Part of the reason is because the old oligarchies still keep part of their uh, power within the rural areas, but it's also the case that all across the world, not only in Latin America, rural voters tend to be suspicious of uh, parties that try to make big innovations and also parties that, as we will see in a second, are going to defend the interests of urban population and not of the export-oriented rural population. Populist movements are going to be very different from social democratic movements, as I was mentioning here before, because they are going to be very explicit a uh, multi-class alliance, or at least the pretense. So if you look at the manifestos, the electoral manifestos of labor in the United Kingdom is about the working class. You know, the same name labor says it all. And that's why they are going to be focusing their interest on this working class. Populist movements will rarely say the working class. They will say el pueblo, the people, not the clase obrera. They may say something like trabajadores, that sounds a little bit more neutral, but in that way, they separate themselves from traditional Marxist parties like socialist and communist parties on their emphasis on the people and not on the working class. They are going to be, these movements are going to be very, very focused on the creation of clientele networks. They are going to use whenever they get to power, the power of a state to have voters that owe to the party some of their income and that they are going to be important part of their base based on their loyalty to the movement. And again, the best example is in Argentina, where every October they still celebrate uh, the day of the Peronist loyalty, uh, el día de la, de la lealtad peronista. And economic policy is going to be based on aggressive short-run redistribution not on long-run reform, which again is going to be very different from social democratic parties in Western Europe that were much more concerned about long-run growth than on short-term redistribution. Surprisingly enough, when you see what happens in Germany when the social democrats come to power, or in Scandinavia, or in the United Kingdom, there is very little short-term redistribution. What you have is a lot of long-run reforms. That's not what is going to happen in Latin America, these movements, these uh, populist movements are much more focused on short-term, short-run redistribution. So after this um, kind of uh, generic and um, white introduction to um, the populist movements, let me explore some of them in a little bit more detail. And it will be, I will be remiss, I will be mistaken if I not use Peronism as the main example. And the reason is very straightforward. Peronism is the most dynamic of the populist movements. And the best way to prove this is that it's still in power in Argentina as of today. The president of Argentina today calls himself Peronist. And the Peronist party is the largest party in Argentina. So who is Perón? Perón is the chap over here, Juan Domingo Perón. 1895-1974. He's a military officer, very nationalist, very, very nationalist, and he's very deeply influenced by Italian fascism. Uh, he spent some time in Italy. He learns a lot from Mussolini. He really likes what Mussolini is doing in Italy. And he learns from Italian fascism, both in terms of form, like the mobilization of the masses, the cult of the leader, 
the structure of a, uh, of a party and in terms of content, a strong anti-imperialist uh, against the US, but on the other hand, and the idea of getting some of his own uh, country, in this case, Argentina, to be a regional leader and so on. Now, Perón, Perón is an expert on talking to each interlocutor in the language they want to hear. So imagine, you know, Perón, this is 1947, Perón is in power, is the president in Argentina, and you are the leader of a trade union. And you go to talk with Perón, and Perón will convince you that he's your biggest friend, that he's the friend of the worker, that he's the friend of the, of the trade unions, and that he's going to do everything he needs to help you. So you will go home very happy. But then half an hour later, you are the boss of some company, and you go to talk with Perón, and Perón will also convince you that he's the biggest firm of Argentinian firms and that the government is going to support you. And that's going to be always a problem. And later on, um, we are not going to have time to discuss it today. We'll only come on the extra lecture or on the video I, I recorded how Perón is going to tell both the left-wing Peronistas that he supports the left-wing revolutionary goals and the conservative Peronistas that he uh, also supports the goal of uh, authority and uh, no change. So he literally tells both the left-wing and the right-wing Peronistas, I support you, despite the fact that the support is incompatible. So how does Peru, uh, Perón comes to power? In 1943, there is a coup in Argentina. The other day on the extra lecture, Gustavo Ventura already told you that in 1930, there is an interruption in the constitutional process in Argentina that is going to evolve over several years. And in 1943, during that uh, process, a new military junta comes to power, and Perón is going to be appointed Minister of, Le Minister, Minister of Labor. And from there, he's going to uh, pass very aggressive legislation in favor of workers, and that's going to make him extremely popular and it's going to allow him to win two presidential elections. So he's going to be in a row. He's going to be president from 1946 to 1951, where uh, he's ousted by a coup. And to a very large extent, I will argue that Argentinian politics to today is just about handling the consequences of the 1955 coup. I never understood why the military went for that coup. Uh, Perón regime was at the very end of the second mandate. There was going to be a new election. Why you want to organize a coup close to the end of an election of a, of a presidential cycle seems to me a little bit crazy, but that's a different story. Uh, Perón moves to, to, to Spain. Again, another big friend of Franco. So again, I was telling about, I was talking about non-transitivities. Franco, big buddies, both with Perón and with uh, Castro. And he will return briefly to Argentina in 1973 to die just next year uh, at the beginning of his third presidential mandate of bad health. I was mentioning before um, that uh, Perón is extremely nationalist. If you want to um, read more about that, uh, unfortunately, I couldn't find any book in English, but at least this one in Spanish should be interesting. Loris Zanata, La Internacional Justicialista, Auge y Ocaso de los Sueños Imperiales de Perón, and how uh, you know Perón really wanted to not only fight against the United States, but also uh, impose the supremacy of Argentina in the region. And if you want to read more about um, Perón and how Perón came to power and what it meant for the future of Argentina, The Political Economy of Argentina in the 20th Century by Roberto Cortés Conde is just such a great book. Now, uh, I mentioned the first day that I like to throw away ideas. I think we still don't understand very well why Perón was able to do what he did, why he was able to put together the most successful, dynamic, and non-lasting populist movement in all of Latin America, and what made Argentina different from any other country. It was the large immigration into Argentina that Gustavo highlighted in his talk last week. It was um, uh, Argentina relatively uh, prosperity at the time, uh, trying to understand why Perón happens is really, really, from a political economy perspective, I think an intriguing research agenda. Okay, but let's, let's focus again, and uh, this is about economic history, about the economic policy of Peronism. So the first thing we want to keep in mind is that Perón believes that World War III is most likely. He basically thinks that the United States and the Soviet Union are going to eventually fight against 
And that's why he wants to avoid globalization. He says, look, we are here in South America. We are going to mine our own business. And that's going to uh, uh, allow me to survive this uh, World War III. And who knows, he may have been uh, right in the sense that in several occasions, I already mentioned the missile, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, World War III nearly happened. He's going to put a bunch of economists in charge of his uh, of this agenda of avoiding globalization and having an inward development strategy for Argentina. And the main person over there is going to be Miguel Miranda. Uh, I couldn't find any better photo than this one. Uh, first from uh, the Central Bank, and then the Banco de la República, and then from the National Economic uh, Council. He's also going to focus a lot on labor market regulation, and is going to introduce a very, very tight labor market regulation, and to force an increase on real wages. And these are the real wages in Buenos Aires. And you can see how you know Perón comes to power over here, and the first as Ministry of Labor, and then as president. And you see that at least until 1949, there is a big increase in real wages in Buenos Aires of around 20%. So this is the type of redistribution that populist movements really, really like to push that high. And also it's going to create a five-year plan of fast industrialization. Mm. The Soviet Union have created uh, this idea of the five-year plan, never quite sure why five became such a you know, focal point. Everyone is into five-year plans. And you know, Argentina cannot be any less, and it's going to have a five-year plan of fast industrialization oriented toward the internal market. It's related with a previous plan that Federico Pinedo have outlined in 1940. This one was much more balanced, the 1940 plan, and much more, um, I would say, thoughtful. But nonetheless, you know, don't take my word for it. If you go to this web address, you can actually download the plan and you can take a look at it yourself and you know, make up your mind. And part of that plan of industrialization is going to be focused on the development of import substitution, exactly as Ivan already told us. And one of them, or one of the goals is to create an Argentina an automobile industry. And this is uh, the car that they come up with. It's called El Justicialista, uh, the Justicialist, because it's the official name of the movement. I mean, Perón could not go as far as call his, his movement himself the Peronist. This is just kind of the nickname. And... <laughs> I find um, that, you know, I was mentioning before the role of clientele networks. The fact that you call the car that is being made by a public company by the name of your political party says it all about the breakdown of formal institution, formal institutions and the abuse of government power in favor of your own personal interest. In this case, promote the name of your own car. Peronism is also going to be about the nationalization of uh, the central bank, which at that time was still uh, owned by uh, private shareholders, about railroads, the nationalization of railroads that used to be, as Gustavo told us the other day, owned by British, although the British actually were more than happy to get rid of them, uh, the utilities, airlines, telecommunications, harbor and navigation companies, and reinsurance. And that's going to be a decisive break with the old export interest represented by the old uh, National Autonomist Party, the Partido Auto Autonomista Nacional, and later the National Democratic Party, the Partido Democrata Nacional, where the conservative parties were really invested in the export-oriented economy. For that, it's going to create the Instituto Argentino de Promoción del Intercambio, the Argentinian Institute of Promotion of Exchange. And you can see it over here, a poster from that time. And you can see how you know they are taking over the banks so they can actually focus on what really is important, like manufacturing and ships, et cetera. And the idea is that in that way, by fully controlling <coughs> exchange rates and by fully controlling international trade, international trade can be put into uh, to help the, uh, the interest of the uh, government and the interest of the, of the five-year plan. 
But that, of course, means that by 1949, we are going to have an 87% difference between the official and the black market exchange rate. Argentina is going to start a process which still lives to today with only brief interactions where the price at which you get um, uh, pesos in the official market and in the black market is going to be very, very different. A very famous economist, Argentinian economist, is not Gustavo, it's someone else, but I'm not going to say his name, was telling me just a few weeks ago how every time he goes to Argentina, he exploits this official versus black market exchange rate differences to make a tidy money. He works in the United States, so he just comes to Argentina with a lot of dollars. And he basically tells me he pretty much his time in Argentina is free because he's financing his, his stay in Argentina by trading with dollars in the, in the black market. Uh, as we were highlighting, these uh, Peronist uh, policies are also very heavily the, based on expansionary fiscal and monetary policies. And uh, as this expansionary and monetary policy may lead into inflation, you are going to have price controls, rent control, electricity, gasoline, which also are aimed at increasing the uh, real wage of workers. And you are going to have financial repression. And the goal here of financial repression is to avoid capital from leaving Argentina and to force in, uh, savings to be directed towards the investment goals of the government. So how is this going to work? Well, we are going to have the boom and bust cycle described by Dorbush and Edwards in a very famous book called The Macroeconomics of Populism. Okay? The Macroeconomics of Populism in Latin America. If any of you uh, is interested, this is actually one of the very first books I read on the economic history of Latin America when I was an undergrad. Really impressed me. And I think still is one of the best books ever written about this. So what Dorbush and Edwards uh, highlighted is that Latin America, after the arrival of populism, is going to go through a cycle that has four phases. Phase one, you have a new government that is going to push for high increases in public spending on real wages and unemployment. And of course, you know, when you push public spending and monetary policy, like very basic Keynesian economics tells you that output is going to grow. And the beginning, you are going to have low inflation because prices tend to be sticky in the short run. And you are going to uh, get the slack that you need by imports. But these imports are going to reduce your reserves or lead to a higher debt. And of course, the president in that moment and the, and the so called, um, the so-called heterodox economists are going to write article after article in the newspaper showing that mainstream economics is proven wrong. All these US economists with PhDs from US universities, all of them are completely wrong because, hey, we have output growth, low inflation, everything seems hockey dokey. Then we have phase two. And in phase two, inflation starts to increase and output growth stops and people starts to get a little bit unhappy. In particular, as the consequences of the increases in public spending start to work through the economy, you have bottlenecks that lead to price, uh, bottlenecks in the economy, and usually governments respond to those by price and exchange controls. But that means also that the government deficit is going to skyrocket. In phase three, as a consequence of the skyrocketing government deficit, inflation gets out of control, sometimes as much as a hyperinflation. Capital is going to fly the country, either legally or illegally, and you are going to have a huge uh, budget deficit by something that sometimes is called the Tansy effect from the economists at the IMF that first uh, named it, but that I think at some level is very intuitive. So imagine that you have a lot of inflation and you are paying taxes on your income, on your wages. Well, usually what happens is that you pay taxes a few months after earning that income. In a country like the US or in Europe, that doesn't make a big difference. In a few months, inflation is like what? 1%, 2%, 3%. Even now with high inflation, we are talking about a 3% inflation in a few months. But if you're in a country with a 200% inflation, 
It means that the taxes that you pay now for your income three months ago is actually half of the real value. In real value, they are half of it. And that's why you have these very, very large budget deficits. And you are going to try uh, to stabilize the economy, maybe by reducing some subsidies, maybe by some devaluation, and all that is lead to a drop in real wages and people is going to be very unhappy. Then, and in phase four, you have a new government that comes and implements orthodox policies to stabilize the economy. Yes, the economy is, sta is stabilized, but it means that the new government is going to be very, very highly unpopular as wages has fallen lower than phase one. And then again, the same stupid economies who brought in phase one that mainstream economics is proven wrong. Now they are going to write that austerity is bad and that you, know, you should not stabilize. And the government is kicked out, usually through elections, because everyone is very unhappy about this stabilization. And we return to phase one. Okay, so phase one is party A, they do all these things. And then in phase four, party B comes to power, kind of fixes the economy. Everyone is very unhappy with party B. And then we elect party A again, who goes all the way to phase one, and we keep doing this. And this is really this boom and bust cycle that Dorbus and Edwards have described that I think is at the very core of what happens in Latin America. And this is exactly what happened with Peru, eh, sorry, with Argentina and Perón. After a few years of fast growth, the economy peaks in 1940. Mm. We have a balance of payment crisis, inflation jumps, they kick out Miguel Miranda, they bring Alfredo Gomez Morales, who's a little bit more reasonable to try to stabilize things, but then, you know, we have a coup, we have an stabilization. Interestingly enough, at least in the case of um, Argentina, they keep many of the Peronist ideas. And the best proof is that the new military government actually asked Raul Previch to prepare a study about the situation of the Argentinian economy. So, you know, you don't really have much of a change. Uh, let me stop here. Uh, there is a brief, uh, couple of brief slides uh, about uh, Brazil with Getulio Vargas. It's a little bit of a weaker movement. The only thing I really want to highlight about uh, Brazil is that in Brazil, they are going to really, really go big time. This is Getulio Vargas and a very nice biography about his time in power, about the creation of a state-owned enterprises. And Brazil is going to be a country where by 1970, 28 of the largest 30 firms in Brazil are state run. Now, in this class, we often talk about macroeconomics and big figures. And you know, I, sometimes I feel bad because we didn't really talk about normal people and how normal people suffer these terrible cycles of poverty, boom and bust. A uh, Brazilian woman uh, learned to read and write and she, you know, despite being very poor, she, she kept some diaries, Carolina Maria de Jesus, and her diaries are, are really mm, not wonderful because her life is difficult, but at least I think a very heartbreaking, you know, really personal um, um, uh, testimony of what it means to be poor in a country like Brazil. And if any of you wants to read a little bit that goes beyond big macroeconomic figures, and remember that at the end of the day, we try to do good economic policy to help, you know, people like Carolina Maria, you know, it's not a bad read. I already taped um, the next session, which will be uh, uh, posted promptly about revolution and reaction. And over there, I'm going to tell how, in some sense, the failures of populism are going to lead to a much more revolutionary uh, prospects, in particular in Cuba, and how that's going to generate the big military reactions of the 1960s and 1970s and how neither of the two are going to help much with, with the economy in the area. But let me stop here and take a few minutes, a few of the questions are still open. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> we have a couple of questions. The first one, we have a theme about the heterogeneous effects of the Cold War across the world. So someone asks is, for example, if there is an effect attributable to the Marshall Plan and the investment done by the US in Asia compared to Latin America? Like mm -hmm. if you can attribute that, the, the difference in, in growth in these two regions. Okay, so the Marshall Plan. So actually the Marshall Plan was not a lot of money. 
Okay, and I think that people tend to have this very romantic view that the Marshall Plan saved Europe. Look, uh, American American health was important. I'm not going to deny that. My father remembers um, the blocks of American cheese and that were given to Spain after World War II as part of his childhood and, you know, being one of the sources of protein when you were in a school. So I'm not going to deny that that mattered. What really, the really, really key thing of the Marshall Plan was that the Marshall Plan basically told Europeans, you guys either get your act together and have sensible economic policies or you are not getting the money. And that's really what made a huge difference. The essence of a Marshall Plan in Latin America was not that Latin America didn't get the aid, is that it didn't have anyone coming and saying either you do the right economic policy or you don't get the money. But of course, the counterfactual is Latin Americans were already very suspicious of the US and of the intentions of the US. Imagine that I'm the Secretary of State and I go to, let's say, Peru in 1948 and I say, look, I'm going to give you all this aid, but you need to stabilize inflation. Am I going to be very popular? Is this uh, something that uh, Latin Americans are willing to accept, while for a number of reasons, when the US is telling the French the same in 1950, the French go and say, yeah, that probably kind of makes sense. And I think that that comes from this very poison relation between Latin America and the US, that Latin Americans by default will be suspicious of the US, while a lot of Western Europeans will not be suspicious of the US. Other question more about the politics of the time is, you gave a lot of examples about socialist or left-leaning uh, countries in Latin America aligning itself with right-wing. So do you have any example of right-wing uh, economies aligning it, let's say, with the Soviet Union? You mean right-wing economies aligning with the Soviet Union? No, I don't think so. In the video that uh, I recorded, I will explain how, for instance, uh, Peru uh, is a very funny case. They are going to have a military dictatorship in the 1970s are going to be very friendly uh, with the Soviet Union, but these were nationalist officers that were leaf Lenin. They were not really right Lenin. And uh, I think that the point over there at the end of the day is if you are on the right wing, it's kind of hard to get much of an agreement with the Soviet Union on anything. The, the really funny thing were kind of Franco, because Franco is kind of this very odd kind of half authoritarian semi-fascist regime that has all this type of very funny um, relations with with Castro and with and with and with Perón. Well, questions about migration in this era. So we have covered a lot of this in in previous slides. But uh, what was the effect of migration from Europe at this time? So, for example, the Spanish Civil War created an exodus to Mexico. Do you see yeah. the same to other countries and so on? Well, yeah. So some Spaniards moved to Mexico. Some Spaniards a little bit fewer moved to Argentina and to Chile, uh, but in quantitative terms, they were not a lot. Okay? So it's around, from the top of my head, I think around half a million Spaniards left Spain because of the civil war. Uh, most of them went to Mexico. I know that in Mexico, they were quite important in the creation of some university and cultural institutions. I think the Fondo de Cultura Económica no, was, was very linked with some of the Spanish Republican exiles but I don't think that beyond Mexico, they really had much of, and a little bit in Argentina, they had much of an impact. And what is going to happen is that the migration from Spain or Italy to the rest of Latin America is going to basically end by the mid fifties when Latin, Spain and, Latin, and Italy start being rich countries or richer countries, let me be careful. And then it doesn't really make any sense to, to, to migrate. Uh, over there. So um, in my family, just to put these things in perspective, there were like two waves of migration. On my, on my, on my paternal side, they migrated to Argentina in the 1920s. That is why a lot, I have a lot of Argentinian relatives. And from my maternal side, they migrated to Cuba uh, a little bit later, around the 1930s. And that's why now I have a lot of relatives in Miami. <laughs> that's also part of what I'm going to talk about in the video. Uh, but by the early 1960s, except a few people migrating to, to Venezuela, migration from Europe had pretty much stopped. So in terms of the economic system, at the end of these decades, basically, Latin America remained uh, 
poor, of course, but it also remained kind of commodity based and relying on the exportation of commodities or what happened no. after the end of No, no, what, what I will argue is it's not really. What, what, I, what I can see over here is that by 19, let me see if I find over here, by 1975, what I see over here is that Latin America first and foremost is a close economy. Look, Latin America is exporting 8% of GDP. These are extremely close economies by any definition of the word. Spain today exports 55% of GDP. And remember, a lot of these exports are actually within Latin America. So this 8% is not from Latin America to the rest of the world. A lot of this may be exports from Argentina to Uruguay and Uruguay to Argentina. And yes, a lot of these exports are commodities, but the reason is, but, Argent but look, as, as GDP, manufacturers are roughly the same level. So if you go to your average European country, manufacturers over here are 26. So if you look at your average European country, manufacturers may be 30%, but it's not, yes, a little bit lower, but you know, take out Central America where these things were lower. In terms of manufacture over GDP, Argentina or Brazil do not look different than Europe or than East Asia. What they look different is they do not export anything. And commodities are not that much part of the deal. It's only around 8% of 7% of GDP. The big deal is that these are close economies. They have decided to follow the import substitution strategy. And that import substitution strategy gives you two decades of relatively good growth. But by 1975, it's a strategy that's just not sustainable in the long run. It just cannot provide productivity growth. So no, I don't think that the story of Latin America in the 1960s and 1970s is the trap of being a commodity export. Now, of course, there are exceptions. You have Venezuela, which is only about oil. Okay, But Brazil or Argentina or Chile or Peru or Colombia, these are not the stories of being export, commodity exporters. These are economies that have a large manufacture over GDP sector, but that manufacturing sector is extremely inefficient, cannot compete in the real, in the external world, and cannot provide enough productivity growth. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Jesus. So we remind everyone that we will continue next Thursday with the Professor Felipe Gonzalez, and he will be talking about Salvador Allende and the case of Chile. Thank you, everyone.